and you will be joined into the conference. Please announce yourself. Daniel Anderson. Daniel, hey. Hello. Hello. All right, it's Matthias. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Well, first, I just wanted to say thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. Oh, my pleasure. All mine. All good. Is anybody else joining us or? Um, I think it's just you and me. Um, and, um... Sean. Okay. Coming on or? Uh, I think he was calling in. I didn't know if he was already on the line or not. He's not on the line yet. Okay. Oh, I think that's him. Okay. Sean Garner. All right. Sean? Hi, uh, is it Matthias? Yes. Okay. Is uh, Daniel here too? Just need to make sure. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Uh, how are you doing today? Okay. Uh, <laughs> so I'm I'm in London at the moment. I'm enjoying the rain. Um, um, and um, thanks for both of you for hopping on the phone. Uh, well, well, thank you for having us, sir. Uh, Daniel, you want to go ahead? Okay. Uh. Just to start out with, uh, again, thank you for taking the time to speak with us. Uh, since our website is pretty uh, heavy on video games and wrestling in addition to just general entertainment, uh, and given the way that the mo uh, how the movie is about a person being uh, taken into a video game, uh, are you a general fan of video games at all, or...? Uh, yes, absolutely. I, I kind of, um, you know, I started by um, actually trying to program my own games with my older brother on the Commodore 64. Um, and then I, I kind of went all the way from Amiga to um, PC gaming to um, the first PlayStation. And then, um, yeah, at the moment I'm uh, on the PlayStation 4. Okay. Uh, what type of games do you like playing? Um, the last game I played, I finished was a little bit, um, well, you know, Call of Duty, um, um, what was the latest, uh, Black Ops 3, I just finished, uh, before that I was into Fallout 4, I did, um, you know, I, I, I like shooters and when I have the time, um, open world kind of, um, games, but, um, nowadays I don't have the time for those, usually. I understand. Have you tried the, uh, PlayStation VR? headset at all you know i tried the um what's the other one the htc is that the one uh the vive the vive uh, yes that's the one I, I did a few games on that um not the not the um playstation one yet i haven't got the playstation 4 plus and i wanted to wait for that oh is it the playstation 4 pro isn't it y yeah. yeah 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 i have a regular pretty amazing isn't it i think I'm sorry. Uh, I mean, pretty amazing the um, virtual reality headsets. I um, I mean, like um, the best thing you can think of for any zombie survivor shoot him, shoot him up. Um, so scary and immersive, isn't it? You have these things creeping up behind you and you have to swirl around and um, and um, attack them. And I, I found it quite impressive. I think personally, one more generation for higher resolution. But um, that was sort of my takeaway. Yeah, I I have the uh, PlayStation headset, and I played Resident Evil a lot. And I think uh, flight sim <coughs> games are also where the VR headsets really show how well they work. Okay, yeah, yeah, that that makes sense. Yeah, I think it's exciting. I think. Oh yeah, I agree. Just being able to look around. Not not so much for movies. I think I don't know if it's going to work for movies, but um, for games, I think it's perfect. Yeah, I think uh, sports it could work really well for if you can get the right camera setups. But, but yeah, I agree. Movies, yeah. 
I mean, movies just seem like it would be a little bit too hard to try to loop everything in on that, especially having the full 360 yeah, exactly. view. So it becomes more like an amusement park ride than a story that you're being tell, told uh, through the framing of a storyteller, I guess. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't mind being uh, live in 360 and inside um, at, um, at a WWF wrestling ring or something. Um, you know, but let's see if that happens. <laughs> yeah, that would be really nice so, to see. Did you, uh, you know, having Batista on set has to be uh, kind of cool. I mean, is were you a fan of wrestling at all? Is is that kind of a reason why you? Uh, casted him or is it is it from his uh, his acting work well you know um, I was um, I was a fan I, I stopped I have to confess I stopped watching wrestling about 10 years ago but um, I um, I was aware of um, of him through through some of the matches and it, I cast him or I spoke to him before he was um he was in Guardians of the Galaxy, and I had seen him in a movie called The Man with the Iron Fist, actually, um, which was one of his first roles. And um, and uh, I had like um, so it, when he came up, um, I sort of had this amazing um, interview with him over Skype, where he um, where he said to me, um, Matthias, with his deep, you know, with his deep gravelly growling voice, so. Um, <clears throat> I really, I really like the role of um, of Arun because you know he's kind of I see him as a funny guy, and you know what? You know, at the moment, every time I go to an audition, all people ask me is to roar and growl and shout, and um, I'm not like that. I'm like a really nice, lovely guy, and, and I want to play a role like that. And, um, and I had to laugh because you know, I, um, of course, he is sort of has this the huge physical presence and this sort of deep booming voice and um at the same time he's got kind of got a really funny glint in his eyes and he is very playful and on set i realized that he's also the loveliest person you could imagine so um you know i thought um when i spoke to him it was sort of one of those moments when you know okay he's perfect and two weeks later guardians of the galaxy came out and um you know that kind of obviously didn't hurt but um i kind of knew beforehand that um he was you know, if I was lucky enough, he was the man to do it. And he was very accommodating because he came to join us um, just after, um, or like the day after he finished shooting um, Spectre. And um, and um, he sort of moved heaven and earth to make sure that he could join us on the film and make the schedules work. And I really appreciate that. Um, it was great. Um, yeah. And you know, in terms of the film itself, you know, what, what kind of um, when I when I got the script, which you know, as a as a sort of European filmmaker, I had only done a, a low budget film before. You get a script with um, written by Luke Besson and um, Robert Kamen. You know, you already start getting a little bit excited because, of course, Robert Kamen wrote, wrote the um, original Karate Kid, and he did Fifth Element together with um, with Luke, and then films like Taken and a million things in between and um, I was sort of very excited about it and what I really appreciated was um, I, I kind of liked the ca slightly 90s throwback narrative um, you know that reminded me of the last Starfighter of Karate Kid of course and also of those um, of the kind of Asian movies I grew up watching like um, Chewie Huck's A Chinese Ghost Story or Changi Mao's Hero or, or um, The House of Flying Daggers which were really cool martial arts movies and um, and I always I, you know I always wanted to do a martial arts movie I did martial arts as a as a teenager myself and I thought um how how much fun would it be to make a film like this? But then I always thought also, um, as a sort of as a sort of German who lives in London, the kind of pitch of I want to do a martial arts movie would only really work with um, a, a sort of one of two Western producers involved, and that would be either Quentin Tarantino or Luc Besson. So um, I, I was very excited when I got the script and sort of um, a chance to make a, a boyhood dream come true. And to me, I felt like the comedy in the script and the sort of innocence um, kind of carries carries the story through and the sort of um, big-hearted emotions you can feel for all the characters. Um, so kind of that was key for me. I felt 
maybe it's not the most original premise you could um could think of, but um I just like the the sentiment and the warmth of the story. And then um I also liked um the action sequences really. And um I remember when I, I, I kind of showed Luke the cut of the film, he was like, Oh, I forgot there were so many action sequences in the script and I was like, Yeah, you know, and you let me do that. It's great. <laughs> so, you know, it's sort of it's it's sort of it's great when you have a producer who who doesn't cut half the action sequences when you get into budgeting, but he sort of just let me do the script and um that was kind of exciting. What were some of the... Uh, I thought that was one of the things they, they, that you absolutely nailed there uh, was the fine things. That they were probably one of the best parts of the film. Uh, you know, I noticed that uh, Uriah Shelton also has like a Taekwondo background. And uh, it, it did uh, all the, did the actors like do their own stunts? Did it help that... Uh, how hard was it to, to shoot those sequences? Well, I think, um, so I've worked with a really great um, Hong Kong action choreographer called Tony Ling, who was um, second in command on um, on Kill Bill, for example. And he, we together, we kind of, we, uh, and it, with his team, we really um, worked together to create those action sequences. And um, what was amazing about Uriah Shelton, who, you know, is, is really just the, uh, still very young actor um I, I kind of when he walked into the room i kind of with his uh, and, and did the audition and i saw his e easygoing charm and his sort of cheekiness and at the same time that he was sort of incredibly good looking but a little bit humble and fun um i already had cast him in my mind and only at the end of the of the session he said oh and by the way um did you know that um i've got a black belt in taekwondo and i was like yes perfect because um in the end it turned out that he was better than his stunt double um at almost everything basically so he did all the stunts himself and he was amazing and it makes a big difference because of course you you can hold the shots longer and um you can you can feel um, what the um, performances are feeling while they're fighting, and it, it makes a big difference. Um, now, I think, um, for example, it was Nini's first martial arts movie, and she did a lot of the martial arts herself. But then, you know, um, was when when the guys go into it, and um, you know, into a into an action setup and get a, you know, get like a, say, a bruise or something, you know, we're all like, yeah, a bruise, no problem. Um, but when you know, someone like Nini, who is sort of a perfect porcelain doll of a person, you know, when, when she kind of broke a fingernail on a piece of armor, punching someone, I, I'd be like so worried about it. And, oh my God, you broke a fingernail. It's terrible because she's so perfect. So, um, for example, she would have on some scenes, she would have an, um, um, an action double doing doing some of the more dangerous things, of course, for safety and all of that. Um, I mean, I think it's um, it's always, of course, um, better to have all the action done by the actors themselves. But then, um, and that's why people like Jackie Chan, who um, used to do that, um, have, have you know risen and become so famous. But uh, yeah, I think. Um, a balance is, is kind of um, also doable, I guess. <laughs> I'm trying to say. I mean, what I'm. I, I think what I'm. The way I'm approaching it really is. Um, I try to make every scene um, primarily a, a sort of a traditional storytelling scene. Every action scene, you know, should have a beginning, middle, and end, just like any other scene in in the film. And um, you should always know um, what your protagonist is facing off against and then sort of be with him and feel with him as he's trying to figure out how to overcome the obstacles that are thrown his way, whether that's, you know, a giant um, mutated um, monster or if it's, uh, you know, a three samurai um, chasing at him, you know, and, and it's kind of, that's kind of to me the key, as long as you understand the geography and you understand what your protagonist is feeling and how he's figuring out how to get around the um, the attack. Um, that's to me a, a successful um, action sequence. Uh, I, I think, um, of course, in modern action, there's a balance that's difficult to hit now where some audiences are very used to um, fast cutting and often it's too fast and you lose a sense of how a fight works. Um, at the same time, when you do 
slow fights without cutting, sometimes audiences find them too slow and they don't feel the impact enough. And I try to find a balance between the two where as much as possible, try to really keep the geography clear, keep clear what everyone's feeling and um, also get a good pace to the action sequences. Uh, we have about one minute left. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, were there any uh, funny stories uh, that you can relate from the filming of the movie? Like anything that kind of stands out of out and makes you laugh as you think back on it? I mean, um, yeah, let me see. I mean, um, I thought, I mean, the Nini's broken fingernail really did bring me to tears almost. Um, and then, you know, I think um, Uriah made us laugh all the way through. He, he, um, he injured... <laughs> He had, an, he had an injury on um, on the shoot, but it wasn't on set. It was um, when he was sort of um, um, air guitaring, uh, uh, like in his hotel room. He slipped and and sort of had a little a bruised foot, um, which you know is, is sort of medium funny. But um, um, I mean, overall, you know, it was just such an amazing um, opportunity for all of us to go and, um, you know, work with a French team, American writer, a German Londoner, going to China with a huge Chinese team where, you know, um, where you kind of make movies at a scale that we sort of don't really do anymore in the West. So, for example, I kind of one, one day I discovered a, a whole department of 20 people working on, on the film and I, I didn't even know what they were doing. And, um, and my... Um, stylist told me well you know that's your um your wig department and all all they did was make all the um beards and fake um fake um wigs for for all the background extras and they, we had like 900 of those 900 fake beards i think um if you had them if you were to buy them in in london or in in the u.s they'd be five thousand dollars a piece but um we just had them lying everywhere and there was um was pretty special, you know, um, and the same, you know, with the uh, with the armor, where um, you could just get everything made out of steel, and um, and you know, and, and and sort of the the Asian teams were so um, wanting to please and wanting to do great stuff. They kind of they took all the designs that I created and you know made this amazing Roman armor for the Black Knight at the beginning, and it was incredibly detailed and incredibly beautiful. But then. Um, one, someone decided that it would be cool to have Mexican murals down the side of the helmet. And I said to them, guys, well, how can you have Mexican murals on the side of a, a Roman antique helmet? And, you know, they were just sort of looking at me puzzled and went, okay, no problem, we'll change it. And then the next day it was changed. Um, and um, it was sort of very flexible and people, you know, they worked overnight to get it done. And that was really impressive to um, just to work with with teams that were so fast moving and ambitious and, um, and, you know, kind of, we're trying to kind of get our cultures to come together. And I think, I hope, you know, I hope more of those kind of, um, projects will still happen. You know, at the moment it's kind of a difficult process where people are trying to figure out, um, if it actually works to make entertainment, um, in co-productions or, you know, you look at the great wall, of course, or ghost in the shell, there was a lot of controversy around those films, but, um, I think that conversation is all, it's very good because it'll just really, um, encourage everyone to, um, to try better next time and to also, um, maybe, um, educate audiences to, um, to, to try films they wouldn't have otherwise, um, seen. And, you know, I think hopefully good things, uh, will come from from this process, you know, artistically good things and entertaining things. So, you know, I think um, it's um, it's an interesting time to be making films. Uh, there is a innocent part in the film where the princess is there with uh, Uriah Shelton's character in the mall, and the first American kind of food that she eats is ice cream. Do you have a favorite ice cream flavor? <laughs> yes. Um, I, I, well, I would say cookies and cream all the way. And you can't go wrong with that. No. Yeah. 
I guess normally it'd be Hagen Dust, probably named Cream as uh, sort of. Do you have Hag Hagen Dust? Sort of a. Yeah, we do. Thing. It's Danish, usually on the expensive <laughs> side here, but, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what's your favorite ice cream? Oh, my gosh. Um, I probably like uh, chocolate chip cookie dough. It's probably my favorite ice cream. You know, there's a, a, a um, in Berlin, in, when I was younger, there there was an ice cream parlor or ice cream vendor had a special had a Smurf flavored um, ice cream. So it was it looked like it was Smurf colored, and it was called Smurf ice cream, and um, and it, I thought it was kind of um, interesting to to eat Smurf ice cream. I don't know if, it was, if anyone else in the world has that, but um, that was one I, I ate growing up. Wow, that's uh, that's interesting. I'm surprised they didn't come out with one after you know they made the movies and everything. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm sure it was strictly um, non-licensed um, and non-allowed, but um, you know, <laughs> but hey, it's all good. Daniel, you have. Well, I was just going to ask, uh, you were talking a little bit about how the co-productions went. Did you find it e easier in some ways to make the, the movie uh, the way that you did, or did it, was it a little bit more complicated trying to involve all these different people from different parts of the world? You know, it was, um, it's very complicated because, um, you know, because, first of all, the language barrier is, is very um, complicated, so um, even the French were kind of sometimes having difficulties understanding English and the Chinese crews, of course. So you end up talk, talking with pictures mostly. And then um, also in terms of casting, you know, to find um, a cast that can, you know, can speak um, English is, a, is Chinese, um, but also, you know, mainland Chinese and um, then can do Kung Fu or is American and can do fighting and uh, to, to make work that out was, out was really, really complicated, you know, because there's not so many actors and, um, and crew to choose from that, you know, speak both languages, understand both cultures. And um, that was not very easy. It would have been, for example, a lot easier to make an old Chinese movie in Chinese language because um, then um, your choice of, um, of actors would have been much easier and uh, a lot more straightforward, I guess. But um, um, I think... You know, I thought at one point we could, uh, I thought about doing a 50-50 a Mandarin English version, but um, that was also too complicated. And, you you know, you can't really show it in properly here in the U.S. And um, so, yeah, complicated. <laughs> Is it something you would do again with, you would be interested in doing again with all the complications? Or is it something that was a little bit more difficult than what you thought? Um, it's really the most difficult thing you can think of, but um, and you know, there's not. That's the reason why there's been so very few co-productions that have, um, you know, have succeeded in, in um, um, a good film by the end of it. But I think, um, I, I, you know, I really like being in, in China, and I love, um, I loved working with with the team there, and also with Tony Ling, the fight choreographer. And I could see myself doing um, a martial arts movie there, maybe something. Um, I've been thinking about maybe a tough, a really tough R-rated martial arts movie in in Asia. That would be that would be a lot of fun as a as a sort of as the next project. Sorry, we're just about out of time. All right. Well, thank you again, Matthias, for being on with us. Absolutely, my pleasure, and um. Hope you got what you need, and I look forward to um, checking up. I'm actually on your way. I've been on your website, and um, I like um, I like what you what you're showing there and writing there. And um, I'm going to check out more after this call. More than welcome to. Thank you. Well, thank you again for your time. Great. Take care. Thank, thank you. you.